Hi everybody, this is Professor Drew Lucas. Um, welcome to the 2020 uh, Co-Essing Summer School. Um, and uh, very excited to be here. Um, sorry, I'm not giving this lecture in person, but, uh, but I'm glad to be able to produce it. And I hope some of you watch it. And um, if you have any comments, let me know. Um, I am, uh, you can call me Drew. My name, my full name is Andrew Johns Lucas. I'm an assistant professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography um, at the University of California, San Diego. Um, my specialty uh, is in understanding uh, physical processes in the ocean, how they influence uh, the ocean and the atmosphere and our climate. I'm also interested in uh, physical processes in the ocean and how they influence coastal oceanography. Today we will talk about a, a particular subtopic of coastal oceanography. Um, I'm interested in how uh, physical dynamics in the ocean disperse um, pollutants, how they disperse larval species, um, and how these physical dynamics come into play when we have to try to understand and manage uh, these processes. Um, and finally, I'm interested in the relationship between the physics of the ocean and the biological productivity. Um, my main uh, goal in oceanography or my main uh, skill in oceanography is, is collecting measurements at sea. And so I do that through going to sea on large vessels, through working in the coastal ocean on small vessels, um, and through the development of oceanographic technology. Uh, the pictures on this slide are pictures um, of a technology that we developed um, on the left. This is a picture of what we call a wire walker profiling vehicle. That's a wave powered vehicle that goes up and down in the ocean using the ocean waves for energy. Um, and we can put on it uh, any number of sensors um, and we can measure things about the physical state of the ocean um, and the biological state of the ocean. Um, the physical state of the ocean is in the top two panels on the bottom right. Um, these are panels of uh, depth in the y-axis and time in the x-axis. This is uh, about two weeks of, uh, of data where the vehicle is going up and down over the upper 100 meters of the ocean, measuring all sorts of variables. Here you can see that the chlorophyll fluorescence, which is related to the amount of plankton in the water, um, is showing some very interesting patterns at depth. Also, the amount of salinity um, is also uh, uh, changing in depth. This is to, due to the influence of a big river. These data were collected in the Indian Ocean south of the mouth of the Ganges River in a place called the Bay of Bengal. That is a very large estuary. In fact, much of Bangladesh, uh, southern Bangladesh is an estuary. Um, and that is what we are gonna talk about today. So if you wanna know more stuff about me, you can find me online. Uh, you can come to the Slack channel, it's hashtag Professor Drew, and you can uh, join the Slack channel. Um, you can ask me what questions you have um, and you can look at my website and you can see the type of work that I do. Okay, so we're gonna talk about estuaries today. An estuary is uh, really a very simple concept. An estuary is any place where fresh water from the land meets the sea. Um, we have a specific definition where an estuary is defined as a semi-enclosed region influenced both by fresh water and salty water. Semi-enclosed just means that it's a region that we can access, and it can be anything from a very small uh, uh, region where only fresh, fresh water only comes when it rains. Um, there's many such regions around Accra that reach into the ocean but are very small um, and normally have low volumes of water, all the way up to the estuaries associated with the biggest rivers in the world, like the estuary associated with the Amazon River or the estuary associated with the Mississippi River, or the aforementioned estuary associated with the Ganges River. So it can, uh, estuaries can be very big and they can be very small, but they always have fresh water from the land and salty water from the sea. Estuaries are uh, regions where, because of the fact they have fresh water coming from the land and, and salty water from the sea, they're a region of very important exchange of properties between things that are happening on land and things that are happening in the ocean. So they typically are associated with human populations, human uh, populations 
are, are very uh, commonly in areas of estuary. And so it also is a place where human impacts on the sea um, can be very strong. The interesting thing about estuaries is because they have fresh and salt water, they actually act differently than the rest of the coastal ocean. And it's these unique dynamics um, that control the exchange between fresh and salty water um, and the transport of materials that may be in the fresh water or the salty water. Uh, this is especially important in estuaries that are characterized by lots of plastics. Um, there are uh, many estuaries in Ghana that are like this and, and many estuaries in the United States as well. Um, so we have to understand why uh, the estuaries have unique dynamics. What is the physical reasons for that uh, in order to predict where uh, pollutants may go, where plastics may go, how the estuary may change uh, associated with climate change. And the final thing to mention is that estuaries are almost always important regions of what we call ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are things that an ecosystem does that support uh, either the human population um, or the surrounding coastal ocean. Um, the most important uh, aspects of estuaries are typically associated with their fisheries. Um, the, the estuaries are often habitat for commercially valuable uh, species, sometimes nurseries for uh, baby fishes. Uh, they definitely act to improve coastal water quality. Undisturbed estuaries are very good at uh, improving uh, the coastal ocean's water quality by trapping uh, pollutants and, and uh, sediments. Um, and many uh, tourist activities uh, and uh, many uh, human-related activities. Here is a very good example. This is a container ship um, entering uh, a U.S. harbor, um, and it is indeed the case that most major ports are also places where rivers meet the ocean. This is because uh, they form natural harbors and also because uh, they, uh, they have access to the interior via the river. Um, and so many major cities like New York City um, are built on estuaries, New Orleans built on an estuary. Um, and so these major cities uh, were there for the reasons that are the same reasons why we're studying them. Um, so they're, they're very important economically, um, but also very impacted by um, activities, uh, including human modification of the system uh, from a geologic perspective. Um, there's uh, typically, uh, and, and it's not very good, but typically there's often um, uh, uh, Sewage waters are discharged into estuaries. In the United States, mainly those sewage waters and industrial waters have been purified before they are entered into the estuary. Uh, but unfortunately, in some places uh, in the United States and outside of the United States, that is not the case. Um, often when there's strong storms, for example, lots of rain on land, uh, there's no way of purifying that water and instead it washes the land uh, and, and flushes it into the sea and the estuary is the place that receives all of that um, uh, potentially um, uh, pollu polluted material. Um, and so we spend a lot of time talking about the health of estuaries because of this impact. Um, here is a picture uh, of a famous uh, movie called Forrest Gump. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but if you have, maybe this will make, uh, make you laugh. Uh, but it's a fishery that's uh, very popular throughout the world in estuaries and is the fishery for shrimps. Um, and in the southern part of the United States, in the Gulf of Mexico, there's major shrimp industry. Um, these are estuary species. There's a nice life cycle of a shrimp here, and it shows that they use both the coastal ocean and the estuary for different parts of their, um, of their uh, life cycle. Um, and so maintaining the health of the estuary is very important uh, in order to maintain the health of this fishery. Okay, so this is not just in the United States. Ghana has some very large estuaries. Here is a uh, nice uh, picture of an estuary in central Ghana. Um, this is a place where the fresh water has flown from the interior. There's uh, large regions that are associated with the river's meanders. Um, and then there is often, in this case, there is, um, some important human modification. So here's a, a good place. Uh, in the Western region, there are many estuaries, smaller estuaries. Uh, here's a mangrove forest. Uh, mangrove forests are found in estuaries. Uh, here's a young man co collecting wood from the mangrove forest. 
maybe even illegally. Um, and there are many villages. Here is also uh, in the western region. It's a small village, fishing village, uh, that has their boats in the estuary and that has access to the outside. So I encourage you very much, if you've listened to this le uh, lecture and you have interest in estuaries, to please come and take the uh, laboratory, the fluid dynamics laboratory exercises that Professor Emily Schroyer and Professor Eileen Cotel and myself have put together. These uh, laboratory experiments will show you um, some of the unique aspects of the combination of fresh and salt water. Um, and fresh and salt water um, have different characteristics. Um, and those different characteristics mean that um, some very interesting things happen. And so you can learn about those in your own house um, doing some of the laboratories that we have put together for you. Um, so here's sort of a picture. And when you think about it, um, the estuary has got a very interesting thing. Um, at some point you have rivers coming down, so it's flowing into the estuary. And then you have a mouth of the estuary to the outside. Uh, but the mouth of the estuary to the outside to the ocean is often subject to ocean tides. Ocean tides are just the surface of the ocean going up and down. And so in many uh, medium and small estuaries, it is the case that in the high tide time, uh, water from the outside, from the ocean, flows into the estuary. And at the low tide time, it can flow out. And the relationship between the tides and the river flow, the amount of fresh water that enters the estuary, the amount of ocean water that uh, enters the estuary, has some very important um, characteristics or influence on the estuary. And so because of this, there are multiple different types of estuaries. I want to teach you some of those names. Um, so here is a nice picture. And this is we're going to look at a number of pictures like this. So you can get used to looking at it. Um, the top part is a schematic of an estuary. And I've just made it a slice. And so what you're looking at is a vertical slice. Um, so that is to say the top is the top of the ocean and the bottom is the bottom of the sea. And on the left hand side is the land and on the right hand side is the ocean. And um, there's one type of estuary which is called a well mixed estuary. And that's where uh, if you go closer to the land side, the water gets fresher and fresher and fresher. Um, and this is a, 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 a common estuary. And it is called well mixed because it is the case that the only variability uh, in the salinity of, this, of the water, that is to say how salty it is, is in the horizontal. So you have to go uh, from the sea to the land for the water to become more like the river. The way we draw this is by drawing these lines that are in the top panel. These lines are lines of constant salinity. It's just like a geographic map of mountains where you have lines on a two-dimensional piece of paper. The closer they get together, those lines, the more um, whatever quantity is changing. Um, and so this is to say that everything um, to the right-hand side of the line labeled S6 is a constant salinity. Everything to the right-hand si side of the line labeled S5 and be before S6 is of the salinity S5. And then you go on and on to the left. And each one of those S's, the salinity is slightly less until we reach all the way fresh water. So this is, there's a good example of this. Uh, my hometown, New York City, uh, USA. It's called the Hudson River, um, and it goes right around New York City, and it is an estuary like this. And so in this type of estuary, we have a region of exchange. The region of exchange is a are, are all those locations where the salinity, that is the saltiness, is not the salinity of the sea, and it is not the salinity of the river, but it is some intermediate. And in this intermediate, there must be mixing between the sea, the salt water, and the land, the fresh water, to create these salinities that are different than both. Um, and it is that exchange that we're interested in because other things besides saltiness is also exchanged, including pollutants. On the other side of the, uh, in the other side of the classification of estuaries, we have the type of estuary that's called vertically stratified. 
So here is this very similar picture, this top panel. You have the land on the left and the sea on the right. The fresh water is entering from the left and the salt water is off to the right. But in this region, the fresh water, there is limited mixing in the vertical. And so this fresh water spreads out on top of the salt water. This is called a vertically stratified estuary. And stratified means that there is a uh, barrier for mixing that is associated with the difference in the density or the salinity between the fresh water and the salt water. In this case, the region of exchange is very different. Um, it is only in the region where the fresh water is lying on top of the salt water. Um, it is uh, typically uh, vertically constrained rather than the whole uh, estuary's vertical depth like the well mixed estuary. And in general, the property exchange is more slow. So here is a nice example of that. The picture on the bottom left is a satellite image of a very big estuary called the Rio de la Plata in Argentina. This estuary separates um, the countries of Argentina to the south, which is on the right of this picture, and Uruguay, which is on the left. And if you look on the sort of bottom right of the picture, you can see that there is a city there. That is the city of Buenos Aires, which is the largest city in Argentina and is one of the most famous cities in all of South America. It is sitting on the estuary. You can see it's very interesting. You have a very strong signal of mud in the fresh water, which is spreading out from the bottom to the top in the picture. And that is because the fresh water is spreading above the ocean. From the satellite, it looks like that the blue water, which is the ocean water, only extends to the very uh, exit of the mouth of the river, but of the estuary. But in fact, if you were to take a measurement going up and down in the middle of the estuary, or even as far into the estuary as Buenos Aires, you would find that near the bottom, the water is actually quite salty. And that is because the river water is spreading out on top of the denser and saltier water. And you can learn a little bit about why it is that the fresh water and the salt water do not mix easily, and why it is the fresh water spreads out over the salt water, if you are able to do some of the laboratory experiments in the fluid dynamics laboratory. So again, I strongly encourage you to go do that. Okay, so we're gonna have to include a little bit of mathematics here. Um, and I hope that you don't fast forward through this um, because it's very important to show the physics. And I'd like to say that um, these equations, uh, while somewhat simplified in this context, are actually not that complicated. If you remember that they're simply just Newton's second law, which you would have learned in your very introduction physics class, uh, but it's been written down for a fluid rather than um, for a solid, which is something you might be more used to. Uh, Newton's second law is simply force equals mass times acceleration. And so this is that, uh, this only says that same thing, force equals mass times acceleration, except it's written for a fluid, and it's written for a fluid that is on the surface of the Earth, and something very interesting on the surface of the Earth, which is the Earth is rotating, and so things act a little bit funny. So let me explain to you these terms in these equations. The first term is says du dt. Here u is simply the velocity of the water, its speed and its direction. Du dt, or the change of velocity in time, is of course acceleration. So here is your a of your f equals ma. The next term is very funny and only appears um, on rotating planets uh, like our own Earth. So we must consider it for large estuaries. It is the term rotation. This is also known as the Coriolis effect. So if you wanna learn about the Coriolis effect and rotation, you can uh, Google it. Um, but suffice it to say at this point that rotation acts to change the direction of the flow. That's why it's on the left-hand side of this equation. When you change the direction of something, it is in fact an acceleration. And so on the left-hand side of this equation, we have two types of acceleration. One, 
the one you're familiar with, change of velocity and time, and the other is associated with the rotation of the Earth that changes the direction. Okay, um, then we have some other important terms on the right. These are uh, terms that are forces, um, and they have been divided by this funny P. This is called a rho. It's a Greek letter. And that is, the rho there is simply the mass. So on the left-hand side, we have accelerations. On the right-hand side, we have force divided by mass. And we have three different kinds of forces here. The first one is in this light blue color, and it is called the pressure gradient. It is that P with that funny upside-down triangle. What this means is that there's a force associated with a slope in the water. And so if you can imagine if you pour water from a bucket and it is splashing on the ground, um, it might start running down and maybe run down a hill. If it runs down a hill, that's because it is higher in one place and lower in the other. This is just a natural thing, and that is called a pressure gradient. And we need to understand the pressure gradients because oftentimes they control the flow. So this is a force, in this case, divided by a mass. The second is something we call buoyancy. Buoyancy is the fact that the uh, salt water and the fresh water have different densities. And so what this means is that if you had, if you thought of oil and water, oil is much lighter than water, and so it floats on top of water. If you were to somehow take some of that oil and push it downwards into the water and let it go, it would immediately rise back up to the surface, and that is because it is buoyant. It floats. This is a force associated with the difference in density um, and the difference in buoyancy, the implicit difference in buoyancy between the fresh water and the salt water. And so this is an important force uh, in many contexts because it controls the rate at which uh, the, the, the estuary and the ocean may be mixing. Finally, we have added a, a, a characteristic, uh, another F here, F stands for force, where we have uh, put in many other types of forces that might be important to estuaries, wind, friction, tidal forces, etc. And so uh, that is to say that we've simplified this equation by including a number of other things. But I would say that this is still very complicated. And we say, what do we do? What do we do? How do we understand the estuary if our equations are so complicated? So we do something that we do oftentimes in uh, fluid mechanics, and it is we uh, simplify our equation by making assumptions. So if you look down here on the bottom left, We've been able to, uh, we've got some words down here. It says assume. So when you say assume, that means that we're going to make simplification in order to make the understanding easier. So we are going to assume certain things. We are going to assume the estuary is in steady state. Steady state just means that it's not changing. So that's very important, not changing. We are going to assume that the uh, estuary can be understood without this funny rotation. Um, and then we can assume that the, uh, that the um, estuary has only limited buoyancy gradients and that it doesn't have three, it's not in three dimensions. It's only got limited spatial variability. We're just thinking about it as a slice. So you say, why would I do that? That sounds all very complicated. Well, it's very good. The first thing, if you assume steady state, you can remove the acceleration term because it is change in velocity, du over dt, change in time. If it is in steady state, there is no change in time, thus it is zero, remove. If we neglect rotation, similarly, we can say there is no acceleration and we can neglect rotation, and so that also is removed. So we've removed two terms, and we've made them equal to zero, and thus we have zero on the left-hand side of our equation. That is steady state in neglected rotation. Very nice. So hydrostatic means we can um, ignore, um, set to zero, the buoyancy term, and by making this um, statement that the variability doesn't have 
y variable. It, it isn't variable in three dimensions. It's only variable in the x dimension. We were able to remove this other uh, complicated upside down triangle and just ask a question about d p d pressure d x. How much change in pressure is there over any distance in x? Finally, we will just include one simple force, external force, and that is the force of friction. So we're going to say that the only terms in the equation that we want are one, the term that is to the, excuse me, uh, to the uh, the left hand, the left hand part of the right hand side of the equation, one over rho zero, negative one over rho zero times dp dx. So that's just the pressure or the slope of the water. And then the one on the other side, is, or the one next to it, plus this term d tau x dz, that's just a friction term. And all this friction term says that the closer you get to the bottom, the stronger the friction. So the only two things that are happening in this equation now are the tilting of the water, dp dx, and the fact that the water is dragging along the bottom, which is creating what we call a stress. Okay, so that complicated equation now has turned into this equation just in the middle of the page, dp dx equals d tau x dz. That is, the pressure gradient in the x direction is balanced by the frictional stresses. It is equal to, when I say balanced, I mean it is equal to the frictional stresses in the vertical direction. And so in an idealized estuary, here's that same picture where the land is on the left and the ocean is on the right. The salinity, which is the saltiness of the water, is zero on the left, and it is 35 grams per kilogram on the right, which is the density of the ocean. And uh, what we are in the red lines are just the lines of constant salinity. And what we have here is that there is a slope in the surface, which is the river is higher, physically taller than the ocean. And that is allowing the water at the surface to move from left to right. Whereas there is this balance um, with the bottom stress, d tau dx, d tau x dz. And that is uh, that slope in the river is controlled. The slope between the river and the ocean is controlled or, or held up by the fact that the ocean, that the water, which is moving, is dragging on the bottom. And so what is very interesting about that is that if you just make all of those assumptions, very simple, you find that there's actually a circulation that develops in this estuary. And this circulation is a very important circulation. It is called an estuary circulation. And it results in the following pattern. If you look at number C, you see the salinity. Salinity, uh, this is now again in depth. The depth of the estuary is H between the surface at the top and the, and the estuary bottom um, at, at, at the bottom. The salinity, which is the red line, is lower near the surface and it's higher near the bottom. Now, if you asked what is the velocity profile associated with that, that is to say, what is the flow of the water associated with that distribution of salinity? Well, you find that the flow of the water is such that the surface is moving to the ocean from the land, um, but if the water is constantly moving from the ocean to the land and the uh, water is getting saltier as it moves from the, excuse me, the, the water is moving from the river to the land, excuse me, <laughs> sorry, the water is moving from the land, which is a river, into the ocean. We know that. We also know that as the water leaves the river and enters the ocean, it becomes saltier. That means it, it must be taking some ocean water with it. So if it is both flowing out to sea and it is getting saltier, that means it has taken some ocean water with it, and thus there must be ocean water entering into the estuary. So just simply pushing river water into the ocean makes a circulation that is on the bottom panel where the 
water moving out um, on the ocean side at the surface, Q1, is a certain amount. The water moving from the river is a lesser amount, but it's fresher water, QR. And thus, there must be some water that's moving into the estuary at the bottom, and that is Q2. And it turns out that you can add these things up at a steady state, the amount of water coming into the estuary, Q2, plus the amount of water coming into the estuary from the river, QR, must be equal to the total amount of water that's leaving the estuary at the surface, Q1. That is to say, QR plus Q2 must equal Q1. Since we always find that Q1 is larger than QR, that means that Q2 <coughs> excuse me, must be into the estuary. So this is very important. These estuaries draw in salt water from the sea underneath the river water that's entering from the land. And that is a very important circulation. And so we ask the question, okay, we say we have uh, that water has come in fresh and it is leaving the estuary at the ocean salty, maybe not as salty as the ocean, but saltier than the river. We had come to ask, how is it that the river water and the ocean water have been, um, have, uh, how is it that the river water and the ocean water have been mixed? A very important aspect of this circulation is the fact that there is a change as you go from the top of the estuary down to the bottom. In the density of the water, that is, is it fresh water or is it salt water? And in the velocity, the velocity is moving in one direction at the surface and it's moving at the other direction in the bottom. We know from many years of fluid dynamics experiments that when there is a layer where there is a change in density from fresh water to salt water, and that layer coincides with a place where the velocity changes in the vertical, that is on the right-hand side of the top, which says du dz, that is to say it changes direction. We know that these regions are regions where turbulence may be created. We try to understand that through something that we call the Richardson number. Richardson was a man who did many experiments in uh, turbulence. And he showed that the vertical change in salinity or density divided by the square of the vertical change in the velocity, if that number was, which sometimes we write as n squared, which is the vertical velocity, the vertical density change, and s squared which is the vertical velocity change. When that number is very small, that is when the velocity change is much bigger than the density change, there can be strong turbulence. And so we try to understand the estuary by understanding the balance or the difference between how fast the water is moving in different directions, which is S squared, and how strong is the difference in the density between the surface and the deep water, which is a relation which is related to what we call n squared. So here's a picture that I took from the uh, Aquida estuary in the western region. The river water is on the left. This is a very small estuary. The river water is on the left. It is very uh, dark colored, <coughs> and the seawater is on the uh, right. And you can see that there's a line between the river water and the seawater. And you can probably already guess the seawater being heavier is probably moving underneath that fresh water. So we ask the question, how do we um, try to understand how this turbulence is generated and how this circulation of the estuary arises? So we ask an important question now which is we showed that you can have this circulation of the estuary associated with just the fact that we were putting in fresh water 
and that it was slowly mixing with the salt butter. That means there has to be a circulation that is moving outwards at the top of the estuary and uh, inwards from the from the ocean to the land um, down in the depth of the estuary. Now we're going to add something that's very important in the coastal ocean, which is the fact that the tide is moving back and forth. The tide is simply, and there's other lectures here at Coessing about the tides. The tide in this case is simply the level of the ocean. How tall is the ocean? We have high tide where the ocean is very full, and we have uh, we call that flood tide. And we have ebb tide when the ocean is getting lower and the tide is going lower. This is associated with velocities, and it's also associated with the pressure gradient. Remember, pressure gradient is just the slope of the sea surface. And you can imagine that if the ocean is changing how tall it is, sometimes it's taller with the high tide, sometimes it's lower with the low tide, you can imagine that this slope of the surface also changes. And this is a consequence of the fact that the slope is relatively small and the tides can change the ocean surface a lot. So here is the picture at the beginning of the tide. This is high tide. This is the beginning of the water leaving uh, the coastal ocean, the, the sea level getting lower. And we will start with the estuary where it is not moving at all, u equals zero, and it has no stratification. That is to say that it is laterally variable where the right-hand side is the ocean and the left-hand side is the river. Each time you go a further distance from right to left, the water gets fresher and it, the height of the water increases because the river is flowing in, okay? So if you look at the blue line on the top right, it shows what phase of the tide we are in. So as the water begins dropping in the ocean, the ocean get level gets lower. And so the slope of the surface gets stronger because the river is the same, but the ocean has gotten lower. So the slope is greater. And that begins to push water, allow water to move from the river to the ocean. This has the if this occurs with the strongest flows, which are these arrows being near the surface and the weakest flows being near the bottom where the flow is frictional dragging on the bottom. So what this does, this flow pattern, which is strongest at the surface and weaker near the bottom does is it carries fresh water over salt water. We call this stratification. And what we find is that as the um, water is continuing to move out, the flow gets stronger and stronger, and more fresh water comes over the top of salt water. And this strong difference between the fresh and salt water means that n squared is large, and thus turbulence, because of the Richardson number, is very small. Now the tide has changed and the tide is past the lowest level and is starting to increase in the ocean. Now the river flow is, the pressure gradient is changing direction where the ocean is taller than the river and that stops the river flow. That stops the estuary flow, I should say. The river is always flowing, but it slows down the estuary flow the water begins to move towards the river, not towards the ocean. That means that the fresh water is being pushed back near the surface. The salt water is moving inshore still. And what that does is that increases the amount of ocean water in the estuary and it decreases or reduces the stratification. And because of this, the stratification is weakened. N squared gets very small. S squared is still very large. And so the Richardson number becomes very small. Richardson number, when it is very small, means that there is turbulence. 
And so once that process uh, stops happening, the tide starts increasing again, and the whole process repeats. So what that means is that every tidal cycle, the water is moving in and out of the estuary, potentially uh, moving pollutants, sewage, plastic in and out of the estuary, but it is also changing whether there is a turbulent flow. The turbulent flow happens when the ocean is entering the estuary or a non-turbulent flow, and that happens when the ocean is leaving the estuary associated with the lowering tide. <clears throat> so we find that the, the tidal signal that's happening offshore is very important to the turbulence that's happening inside of the estuary. What this means is that the um, exchanges between the ocean and the river have changes depending on the tide. So this is very important if you want to know about coastal water quality or water quality in an estuary to know when the river water and the ocean water are mixing. And they are mainly mixing when the ocean uh, tide is increasing and the water is entering the estuary. So here's some things for you to learn and you can review these slides at your own time. We have different names for different types of estuaries and the, the, the different types of estuaries are associated with how strong the tide is at the ocean side on one part and how strong the river is on the land side. So uh, the most turbulence happens when the tides are very strong and the river flow is very weak. And we call this a well-mixed estuary on the bottom right. On the top left, when the estuary, uh, when the river flow is very strong and the tides are very weak, this is the case in some estuaries in Ghana, we call this a salt wedge. These are very uh, estuaries that have very strong stratification. <clears throat> There's a nice example of that in the ocean uh, picture of the Rio de la Plata Argentina estuary. In between the two types at the extremes, salt wedge where the river dominates over the tides and well mixed where the tides dominate over the river, there are two other categories. One is called weakly stratified when the tides and the rivers are both important. That's on the top right. And on the bottom left, we have strongly stratified where the tides are important, but the river is more important. So it goes down, uh, goes from the top left to the bottom left, and then the top right to the bottom right. And in that order, you have increasing mixing. So here's another picture of that. Um, and this is a little bit more complicated. I'll have you spend some time on your own looking at this. Um, and it shows many different estuaries. It's very complicated, in fact. It's never so simple to separate something. Um, but many big estuaries are either <coughs> um, salt wedges, strongly stratified, um, or well mixed. And so you can look here and see if you can find some estuaries that you'd like to know about. And so I want to talk at the end of this lecture, I want to talk a little bit about one very good example of why this is important. So this is back to the river in Argentina called the Rio de la Plata. I worked there for two years, almost a year and a half, um, when I was very young before I did my PhD. And I worked with a group of fisheries biologists who were studying the fisheries of the estuary and the fisheries of a species called white mouth croaker. Very important fish, large fish, delicious white meat. Um, and they lay their eggs in the estuary um, and they spend their adult lives also somewhat in the estuary, but also in the coastal ocean. And so the people that I work with recognize that these fish were laying their eggs in a very specific location. So they went out and did some studies and they looked at the middle of the estuary, 100 kilometers inshore, 100 whole kilometers inshore from this edge where the brown water and the blue water are meeting from the surface satellite picture. 100 kilometers where the surface water is just purely river. If you look at the top panels on the left, you can see the, the vertical bars are the numbers of female, a fish, 
and the numbers of eggs that they have found. On the left-hand side, on the bottom, they have drawn a schematic. This uh, estuary is a salt wedge estuary, freshwater on top and ocean water entering from the bottom. And what they showed was that fish are choosing the location where the estuary water meets the fresh water. And that is under the surface. You would never be able to tell from looking at the satellite, but down there, there's a place where the salt wedge reaches the bottom. And in that region, the water near the surface is moving outwards, but the water near the bottom is moving up into the estuary. Because that region at the edge of the salt wedge, which is where all the little fish are shown, because that region is where the fresh water, which is moving offshore from left to right, and the ocean water, which is entering from the bottom, is moving from right to left, that is a region where things can accumulate. <clears throat> and it's very interesting that this very important fish species can find this location where the physical exchange mechanisms of the estuary are a region where things can collect and eggs and sperm can be entered into the water column and the fish can uh, effectively reproduce because of this physical mechanism of the exchange flow of the estuary. And so they found and they demonstrated in this very nice paper that my friend Marcelo Acha wrote that the fish spawning habitat was associated with the estuary physical dynamics. This is very important information for the management of these species. So I look forward to talking to you a little bit more about this in my office hours. My office hours will be Tuesday and Wednesday um, of the week, excuse me, Tuesday and Friday of the week um, at 3 p.m. Accra time. Um, I have put the information in my Slack channel, which is hashtag Professor Drew. And so if you have reached this far and you know the answer to this question, what is happening with this brown water, which is exiting the estuary and turning to the right, you can please let me know. Finally, I'll just talk a little bit about um, the measurements that you can make in an, in an estuary. In my work, I make many measurements uh, on my own, and I talk uh, about making measurements offshore in the open ocean and also making measurements in an estuary. And so you need to know many things about an estuary to understand how it's changing. But I just wanted to show you that we were able, with very small boats, to make very uh, uh, dense measurements of an estuary. This is in New Zealand, which is an island off of Australia. And we took ourselves down there, and you can see in the bottom right here is a picture of me and a guy that I work with a lot named Tyler We're on the back of a very small boat. We have a fishing rod. And at the end of the fishing rod, we have attached instruments. And so here's an example. Oops. I thought that was a video. So here's an example of me using the fishing rod and so we went back and forth across the estuary doing this and we were able to um, make samples here's the instrument package uh, with a gopro camera we're measuring the temperature and salinity with this instrument on the right the dissolved oxygen with the instrument on the middle and the um, amount of turbulence with the instrument on the left and we put it on the end of the fishing rod <laughs> See ya. and we put it off the side of a small boat and then we're going to drop it into the ocean with the GoPro camera attached and a fishing line attached to it. You see how fast it drops as soon as it goes in the water. Hear the engine here. You can see the fresh and the salt water alive on top of each other. And you'll see me start to drop it right now. Hold on. And it starts 
the drop. See the instrument falling. It's getting darker and darker as the instrument enters down into the um, into the estuary. This is a fjord, so the estuary is very deep, falling down almost 50 meters. Now it's being pulled back up by the electric motor. to get uh, constant measurements from the surface to the bottom across the estuary. This tells us where is the salt water and where is the fresh water. Here is a nice example of my friend Jude riding a kayak taking measurements. We can also use autonomous vehicles. We can use robots. We can use any instrument that can measure underneath the surface. This is a good example of the type of work that we can do on the small boats. So to finish up, thank you very much for listening. I showed you some of the tools that we use to measure the estuaries at the very end, but I'm more than happy to speak more about this with you um, in my office hours or answer any questions on Slack. I think I have hopefully showed you, although this is a lot of material, uh, you can review it and review these slides and ask me any questions, but hopefully I've showed you that the physics of the estuary is very important to know, that you're able to learn about the biology and about pollution dispersal and plastic dispersal by understanding the physics of the estuaries. And finally, that you do not need a lot of money necessarily or a big boat to make uh, studies of estuaries. You can do it from small boats as long as you have a small amount of instruments. If you would like to know more about that or anything about coastal oceanography, please let me know. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to spending time with you this week. Cheers.